Hello everyone, welcome to another one of our panels for Indie Plus Game Night. Uh, my name is Rich, and we have an excellent panel here. This event, first of all, it upholds the Indie Plus Community Standards. To find out more about the standards, Google for Indie Plus Community Standards. Please be aware that this event may probably include explicit, but probably not abusive language. Uh, the title or the subject here is uh, how to how to GM or game master an awesome first session. So this is about tabletop RPGs, and I have a number of panelists here uh, from various places within the hobby, and I'm pretty excited to bring on. First, we have we have Jeff Rintz, uh, formerly of Jeff's Game Blog, and one of the founders of Flail Snails. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for being on, Jeff. Next, we have uh, Kira McGran, who is one of the Games on Demand leader and a pretty accomplished GM herself. Hello, Kira. Hey. Next, we have uh, and we have oh, it's so great, Todd. You get to be third. And usually, like T's are like way late in the alphabet. It's true. We have, yeah. we have Todd Nicholas, who's one of the hosts of the Jankcast, one of my absolute favorite podcasts ever. He's one half of the Wheel of Tree Press, uh, which is a new uh, game design group collective conglomerate type of thing. How are you doing, Todd? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Cool. Next, we have Trey Grisby. He's a longtime gamer. He's currently organizing LugCon, which is short for Lettuce Game. That's an online RPG convention. How are you, Trey? Doing great. Happy to be surrounded by so many awesome people. I know, right? And then last, uh, but certainly not least, is the, the writer behind the D&D with Porn Stars blog, as well as a number of other awesome things, like I Hit It With My Axe. It is Zach Smith. How are you, Zach? I'm good. Thank you. Good. Now, we do have questions and answers on, so if you're watching this live, feel free to submit any questions about how to GM an awesome first session. But before we begin this uh, this little hangout, all of the followers of the Indie Plus, Google Plus uh, uh, group, we did ask for it if you had any, any questions, and we got quite a few awesome questions, so we're going to kick off. The first one is from Marshall Miller. And Marshall asks, uh, and now, the way that we'll run through this is um, I'll start off and just ask the question, and if there's a little bit of hesitation, you know, nobody does, has an immediate answer to step up, then I'll call on somebody, and then you guys feel free to talk back and forth uh, as we answer all of these questions and you share your advice and your expertise. So Marshall asks, in books, a lot of emphasis is placed on the first line. Is there an RPG equivalent? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just step up there. Um, there is, because it's kind of like the ambiance, the feel that people get as soon as they step into your game. So whether you're, I was going to say, there's kind of two types of gaming. There's in line, or sorry, online and in person. And so in person, I've seen people dress up, and that just automatically sets the tempo. Um, not LARPing, just dress up. The GM will be dressed up. Um, so yeah, there is the first impression I would say not the first line but the first impression you give as a GM is important because they're going to remember that yeah I kind of think maybe of the first image I um, whenever I, I have the same trick for GMing um, dogs in the vineyard every time which is I say okay you're all coming up over a hill on your horses and you see that the first town you're going to below because in dogs in the vineyard you always go to a town um, and I let the characters describe uh, you describe your character. Like, what what do you look like coming up over the hill? What are you thinking about? Are you know? Do you have a scarf flat or your your coat flapping in the wind? Do you have a hat? You know? Do you look stern? Are you talking to someone? And I kind of let them each narrate themselves coming up over the hill, just to let the players kind of have the first image on some level. I I, I do think there's something to kind of having a cool first image. And some games have kind of embraced. We can talk more about this later, but some games have kind of embraced having almost a tutorial for the first mission uh, or the first uh, uh, session where you have actual things you say during the session. So Swords Without Master, I think, is a big one here, where you actually read certain things during the first session, and there are literally then first lines. It starts by describing the city in a really cool way that you start out in. I think you, Todd points up something. It's like the first thing... The first image that you describe, but it's also the first choice that the players make. It's almost like there's yeah. two separate beginnings, you know. And oh, they can all—they can both be the same moment, or they can be two different moments. 
if we're going to abuse the uh, book metaphor a little bit more, books also have covers and introductions and prefaces often. So before you get to that first line, there's room for doing some things to set it up ahead of time like having good communication with the players before you sit down at the table so you can communicate some expectations and read their expectations as well. Yeah. I don't know if I'd call it a, a book. Uh, I don't like the book metaphor. I, I prefer like the pilot TV metaphor, like the first <laughs> TV, first episode of a TV show because um, gaming to me is episodic, so yeah. I always think of it as, as that, that way instead, actually. Uh, but yeah, it's totally important. It's like the first episode. It's re very important. It's very impactful. And you, sorry, you really set a tempo also, because if you have people that are going to be distracting, they're probably going to be distracting the whole time. Oh. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, how you start is going to be how you end. And yeah. if you don't like that first five minutes, uh, well, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, a game that does this cool is Siren, which automatically, which begins the same way every time, which is it automatically begins with the characters in a vehicle that crashes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so all Siren games actually tend to begin very cool because your characters don't know anything about themselves and it puts you right in the middle of something. And going back to what you just said, Kira, about like a cool pilot episode for a TV show, like the worst thing, and I think this, this is going to come up over and over again in this conversation, the worst thing I think like pilot episodes for TV shows do is a ton of exposition. Like, on some level, I want something to happen right away. Like, I, don't, I, I really don't need to know everything about the characters. I don't need to love the characters yet. I will grow a love for the characters over the course of the episode and over the course of the show, but I need something that gets me in right away. And I think for that crash in Siren, that's a really good example of that, where it's like, you don't know the characters yet, but they're in danger immediately. Like, immediately this thing has happened that's gotten my attention. And I think that's a really cool first image for a game is something happening right away. Yeah, Jez Gordon, uh, a GM who does a lot of flail snails, does every game, no matter what he's doing, begins with basically that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've seen him run a Star Wars game like that and a post-apocalyptic game like that. It's just a car crash right away. Um, but Walter Hill, the screenwriter, said, you know, we don't do... I don't do backstory you know, you just, you start the character in a situation and then you learn, they learn by doing. And I think that that's not necessarily everyone's style and not everyone wants to do that, but I want to do that and it always works. So if your players are okay with that, then if your intuition is that that'll work, it's as far as I've ever seen correct. Because the real backstory of every character is the player who's not going anywhere and they're going to slowly put their personality forward during the course of the game anyway. <laughs> I think one point I want to make, too, is restraint on the GM. Um, a GM at their first game is probably really excited or should be really excited for the game, and I think too much can bore people. So you got to really have that perfect line of giving enough information to get people started, giving enough information so people feel part of it, but not going into two, three chapters of your story or whatever, however you do it, you know, 15, 20 minutes where you've bored everybody and they're like, wow, well, I wanted the game too. <laughs> so try not to talk too, too much, but still give the pertinent stuff. Hey, on that, Trey, I'm, I'm really curious here because one of my favorite games to run is Lady Blackbird, and it has a, a bit of box text that I always start off the game with. What are your guys' opinions about, you know, if you, if you know what you're going to play ahead of time, and, it, and it, what, what do you think about starting off with a box text? Good idea, think, bad idea? I think box text is an abomination and has uh, has created generations of terrible game masters who can run games for years and years and years without and still need help learning, like, what do I say? What do I do? I think um, that having said, been said, there are people who think it's really fun and it's cheesy and they go, the lightning crashes and that's fun for them and fine. <laughs> I've, I've used it. Uh, in fact, the last game I ran, I used a box text to start things off. Um, You're a but, monster. Yes, I am. <laughs> but, but there are two caveats I would apply to it. First of all, I made sure it was short. It was two paragraphs. Second of all, I did not read it. I gave it to an, one of the players at the table and said, could you read this dramatically for the rest of us, please? And he did a good job delivering it because I picked the right person to do it. <laughs> That's a good point. 
Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is a little bit of distance from it. I think if you read the box text and then you are trying to talk like box text for the rest of the game, which I think is yeah. how the naive view of box text, then that's, I think, when it's the real problem, is you read that and then you think that the only way to respond as a game master to anything from then on is with that same level of thing. And I think yeah. getting a little bit of distance from it, like, this is the way the game starts. It's a module. We're running this. Have fun. You know, I think that's maybe the way to do it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think throwing a choice to the players as soon as possible is, is usually preferable. But, All right, Kira, um, box ready. text. Let us know, good or bad, box text. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have an opinion about box text. Uh, I was trying to think back to the last time I ran a game with box text. Uh, and I think that the closest I could come to you, so like this past weekend, um, uh, I organized Games on Demand at Origins, and I ran Dream Askew twice. Uh, which is the in, in the queer apocalypse, you know, it's an apocalypse world hack, but it's jamless. Um, and you do have to read like two pages of text, but it's actually how to play the game. Yeah. Um, and you actually just all read it out loud because that is like a shared GM responsibility in that game. So that's interesting. Like it kind of shifted the box text away from description, uh, you know, of the setting or what's happening, and more into like the rules and the mechanics. So yeah. everybody then could successfully narrate without box text. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Uh, I I'm not a huge fan of box text, I guess, but I I do see where it's used sometimes in one shots, or it can be fun. Um, I think there's a stigma. We think of box text in like you know old, older games that yeah. were relying on that as a GM tool. And I, I don't think I like that as a GM tool really. You know, I, I I think you're hitting on something interesting here, which is I think there's a difference. What you, what you want to avoid, I would say, with box text is this thing where you set up a certain kind of relationship between the GM and the players in the first session, which is, I'm going to read things to you that are kind of pre-planned and pre-prepared, and you are then going to respond to them. So I think when you, if the box text sets up something different, if it's more like, this is how we talk in this game, this is what the world feels like, this mm -hmm. is what the world looks like, these are how the rules go, that's awesome. I actually think that's really useful. I think it's really yeah. cool to have a game that begins with something that kind of goes, you know, here's the vibe of this world, or here's the vibe of this game. But conversely, if, if the relation... Because I think that can set up a cool relationship then, where the players go, oh, I get, I get the vibe of this game. I get what this feels like. Whereas conversely, if the, the, the relationship the box text sets up is, you know, I'm going to read things to you and you are going to react and then I'm going to read more stuff to you, that is, like, Zach, that's an abomination. <laughs> like, I don't like that. That's boring. Well, and um, along those lines, it's interesting that you say that because Dream Askew actually tells you to uh, give the text to each person at the table so that there's a shared responsibility in reading exactly. that text. So yeah. it actually, like, defers the, the GM rulership or whatever. I think this gets to this larger question about first sessions is that, and we kind of already alluded to this, that first sessions set up not just the world and the characters, but also the relationships, the social relationships at the table. They set up do how much buy-in do the players have to the world? How much? What is the relationship between the GM and the players? Is this a game where the GM is going to kind of tell everyone what's, what's happening, what they're doing? Do the players get a lot of narrative control? Whatever it is. So on some level, like, box text is... Box text is useful depending on what you want your your game to feel like and to play like at the table. Um, it's useful if you want a certain kind of game to have it a certain way. It's useful if you want a different kind of game, like you just said, to let people share it or whatever it is. And if you want another kind of game totally, it's useful to not have anything like that and not have anything pre-planned, not have anything you read, because that's going to set up some kind of dynamic at the table, I would argue, that's going to then perhaps affect at least certainly the first session and, and maybe the rest of the game. And I've had I've been in that exact game where the GM sits down and starts reading a pre-planned pre thing and then everyone spends the rest of the game just kind of staring at them waiting to be entertained <laughs> because that was kind of the immediate mood that was set. Yeah. And I just want to respond to what Todd's saying. That's a really good point. Um, I hate to say it. You're... God, I'm going to get hate mail for this one. You're not really GMing if you're just dictating to the players all this stuff. So I like what Jeff was saying, a lot of people have kind of echoed, is give the players maybe something to read out loud. I've been in games where they've given me something to read, and I was shocked, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and just remember as a GM, it's your point to interact with the players almost like a Shakespearean play. You know, it does seem stage where, yeah, I stop and you pick up as a player and start saying something, but stop 
let the players respond, you know, let them interact. So, yeah, don't just read stories upon stories to them because, yeah, that's fun, but it's like you should get them a blanket and a pillow and lay them to bed for that <laughs> and not bring them to a game session to actually game because players usually want to game. They want to roll dice and they want to make a choice. Yeah. yeah. I think the idea of a, a GM as storyteller, I think people think, like, the, the natural idea that comes into your head when you say storyteller is someone who says words. But I actually think the GM is storyteller. Your storytelling function is more about channeling different things so that they create a story, and that is channeling the player's input, channeling where the dice rolls go, channeling when you make your things that you're in control of happen and how you make them happen, how you talk about them. So it's kind of, you're, you're not storytelling like the like like a person sitting talking, you're storytelling like a director of a movie in that really storytelling is letting other people do their job at the right time um, or organizing the way they do that. And I think so, uh, like... When I was doing my, I hit it with my axe, like, I'm a terrible narrator. I don't narrate much at all. Uh, and it was on TV, and everyone was like, that guy doesn't do any descriptions. And I'm like, no, because I'm throwing the game open to the players as soon as possible. Because whatever they do, that's creating the, as, you know, a lot of the story. And then I take what they do and make it make sense within what's going on in the bigger sense. And that's I more of the job than going, you know, the damp wood sodden like the skin <laughs> yeah. of a fish that's been boned. You know, like that stuff is actually more like a different activity that the players didn't sign up to do, which is listen to you talk. Nice, nice, nice. All right, we've got a question from the audience. Trent B. asks, um, Pyle, do you, uh, do you do anything in particular to help new, inexperienced players connect and have fun with the game and group? Well, first, it's identify who's inexperienced. Um, that's the first thing I do as a GM because I want to coddle them a little bit more, and I do want to instruct them when the opportunity presents itself. So I run a lot of one-shots. I have a game called The Matrix RPG, and so I've constantly run one-shots to get people into the game. And so I try and identify the people who haven't played as opposed to like my playtesters who have played a lot because it's like, hey, playtesters, we got a new guy. You know I'm going to spend a lot more time on them making sure they understand it. So I'd say first is identify who isn't experienced in Pathfinder, Shadowrun, whatever it is. How do you identify them, Trey? Um, usually just asking them the simple questions, you know, what I consider simple. I've been playing Shadowrun since the 90s. So if they don't even understand the concept, it's like, oh, okay, we're going to have to start pretty slow with you, not hit you with something where I assume that you know everything else behind it. You know, it's kind of like, um, if I say corporation, I can't assume that you know all the corporations. So then that's where my storyteller mode kicks in, like Zach was saying, and I explain a little bit more. I say, well, this evil, okay, it's as technology, but this evil corporation, as technology, who likes to do a lot of more blood magic kind of stuff, comes at you with the experienced group. Um, to try and take your money or something like that. And so I give them more description. But you can tell right away if you're the GM, you're the most experienced, you, you should be one of the more experienced people at the table. You can tell when they can't answer the simple questions or you get the vacant look. You know, they're just kind of like sitting there waiting for more and it's like, okay, they're probably not picking up on what's happening. Or they might know a lot about the game and they're just inexperienced to gaming with other people. I mean, there's different levels of inexperience. It might not just be rules. It could just be playing with this type of people and so you got to set them at ease and sometimes that means putting a breadcrumb trail for them you know giving them a little bit more I love new players <laughs> I, I want new players to come join us all the time in this hobby I want more people to come join us um, but no that's a really good point about identifying the new players um, if you're at a convention it's hard to know like what level everybody's on so like normally I'll like ask everybody at the table have you played a game like this before uh, you know, how many games have you played? Uh, in my Night Witches game uh, that I'm running at home, I'm testing, playtesting Night Witches, uh, I have two new players who have really never role-played at all before, um, and that's awesome. So a good trick with them is to, sometimes they're not as good with the creative uptake, um, so ask them a question, they're like, I'm not sure, 
go around the table, come back to them is a good trick because um, they might be just hesitating to come up with something clever on the fly. Uh, so I find that a lot of new players um, sometimes have that trouble where they, they can't come up with a creative answer right away. Yeah. Well, Jeff, from your experience with flails... I think skills, you're hitting on something. Oh, oh go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead, Todd. Sorry. I was just going to say real quick, I think you're, you're hitting on something that, that Trey was getting at too, which is this idea that the inexperience could be about the rules or it could be about role-playing, and I think those are going to be handled differently. And I think, uh, I always think a solution, this is kind of going to something Zach said, which was give players a choice. Because regardless of whether they don't know the rules or they're not used to role-playing, whatever it is, like, everyone wants to feel involved. So to me, like, the worst thing you can do is kind of coddle them too much on some of them. You want to protect them a little bit, but I also think you want something that makes them feel like they are affecting the game, like they're participating in the game right away. So when I have new players, I tend to usually... So let's say if I had a table for a first session of four players, two knew what they were doing, two had played this game, two had role-played a lot, and two hadn't played this game or hadn't role-played a lot, I would probably start with giving something to do for one of the two experienced players so so they could kind of model, ideally model for the other two people, this is what it looks like, and then immediately go to the other two people to kind of, what do you do? What's going on? What are you thinking? What do you get out of this? Just to get them some buy-in right away. I know you want to give them a model of, of, of how to do it and then let them make a choice to have some buy-in. Uh, I yeah. was going to ask... Oh, Jeff, with, with your... Say, go ahead, Zach, sorry. I was just going to say quick. I was going to say, yeah, show them the other players making their choices and then they can see how the game works because it's by example, but yeah. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Jeff, uh, with, with flail snails and your experience with that, is there anything that you do in particular different from what we've already discussed for new and inexperienced players joining? Well, uh, with new players, I try to make a point very early in the game of just for a moment in a tense situation, ignoring the experienced players and putting the new player on the spot and letting their decisions have consequences immediately so that they can see that what they do in the game matters. It's not just a matter of what's going on in the dungeon master's head and what the weird people who already know the score are doing. Totally. Yeah, good point for sure. Give them a little spotlight kind of. Yeah. Cool. Bro, uh, we'll kind of move on to another question we got from the audience. Thanks, by the way. Two questions. It's awesome. Keep them coming. Uh, this is from Brock C. If you have a player or players who are a bit passive, and I know we've touched on this a little bit, but let's go ahead and, and dig in a little bit. If you've got a player or players who are a bit passive waiting for the GM to tell them what the quest is, who the bad guy is, any tricks for getting them to be more proactive or engage them? And Jeff, I think you kind of teed that up pretty well with just hitting them with a decision. Any other pieces or parts that we could throw at the new player to get them out of that turtling shell? Well, I know in regular in games that um, that work in a traditional kind of way, when you're not in combat, uh, who does what when is sort of freeform, and then when you are in combat, there's turns. And I find that a lot of times new players, you just kind of let them tag along if it's going to be a combat-heavy game anyway until there's a fight, and then when there's a fight and they really have to make a decision because it's their turn and it's nobody else's turn or any other turn-taking situation, then you let them really play out their turn. You know, make sure that you're just like, so here are the things you could do if you don't know, and then when something happens, you make sure you're describing the consequences of their action like in, in enough detail that, that they see, oh, what I, you know, and you just kind of make a meal out of their turn during a turn-taking situation. And I found that if you do that after a while, then they start to get into the flow of the game when it comes out of turns and combat pretty easily because they learn, oh, I'm, you know, I say this and that's funny, or like I can heal and nobody else can, or, you know, like when the game just demands it, then you can kind of... It, the way you get someone talking in a conversation is to get them talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's, and it's stupid advice, but, you know. So when the game is demanding that people make choices, you put the spotlight then, and then you draw it out, and then you show them how much they have to, to, to bring to the table already just by talking. And then, by, then eventually they'll start to sort of spontaneously interact. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that, especially when you're in the kind of game where you can give them a few mechanical options as to what they can do when their turn comes around. But then you can also say, and any other ideas you might have at this point, or maybe you want to talk to the veteran players and see what they could add to this before we move on. Don't hesitate to slow down the game at that point where you're involving the new person. I also think that as the GM, you have all kinds of tools for interacting with the players. And kind of going to what Zach just <coughs> said about getting people talking is getting them talking. Interact with them with your tools in the world. To give you a, a quick example, I, I had an Apocalypse World game I was running where there was a brand new role player in it. It was his first time ever playing a role playing game. It was his first time ever playing Apocalypse World, obviously. And so a couple other people did stuff and he was playing a savvy head uh, who were kind of the um, tech people in Apocalypse World. And I didn't know what to do with him at first. So the first thing I had happen was I said, "What you know? where would you be on a normal day? He said, oh, I'm probably in my workshop working on stuff. And he was kind of being quiet and not really doing a lot. So I just had an NPC who I just made up on the spot walk in the door and say, hey, you know, everyone around here is kind of a douchebag, but you're actually always really cool to me. Someone just took all my stuff, and I'm not very tough. It was, it was basically like, a, like a, a very tiny person. I'm not that tough. Could you go, like, fix this for me? Like, I'll go with you. Like, I'll stand behind you and, and egg you on, but you have to go punch someone in the face for me because otherwise I'm going to lose all my stuff. And he kind of, like, looked at me, and he was like, well, can I do that? I was like, you can do whatever you want. And he was like, cool, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. And he went, and he did it. And, like, then ten sessions later, like... He and this NPC are in a relationship. Like she's pregnant. They're gonna run away together. Like the, and the, like because I was just like you said, I was just trying to get him talking. That's all I wanted to do was he wasn't talking. So it was like I will interact with you with an NPC just to get you talking. And not everyone's even some people then will still pull back. But if you if you can take an NPC and put them in their way and say I am going to talk to you at this end with this NPC. That's always a great way to because once you get someone talking, like that's your entree into it. Like, if he didn't, if it didn't work out with this NPC, he could have said, "No, I don't really want to go do that. I would have put something else there, right?" But once you find something that their focus goes to, like when their focus goes to an NPC or goes to an item or goes to something in the fiction that you can tell this player just went, "Ooh, that thing's shiny," like that to me just became your tool to get them interested. So put as if they're they're kind of turtling, said put as much in their way as you can until they're not, until something clearly grabs their attention and makes them talk, makes them interact. And then you have your in, you have your tool to use the rest of the game to kind of draw them out. And I think one thing to really point out is you are the GM, so you have a lot of tactics you can use. Don't ignore them. I mean, really, letting somebody turtle can be kind of a killer to the game because I want everybody to have fun, and if one person didn't do anything the entire game, I'd be pretty bummed. <laughs> you know, that's usually the time that I'm like, wow, well, after the game, I do like a wrap-up with them. Like, what happened? Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't it, did this not work? Do you not like it? Because if somebody has absolutely nothing to say after I've tried all that stuff, then something's up. And they, the one time or the few times that it's happened, it's usually been they were dating the other person in the game. <laughs> so, you know, they just were like, I'm here just because, you know, Bobby's here, whatever. I have a short other point to make, but it won't be very long. Um, I actually find that uh, spotlighting turtling characters can actually uh, increase their anxiety level, yeah. uh, or players rather, yeah. because they don't want all the attention on them, but they just kind of want to socialize. And it could actually be more of a social dynamic that's happening in the game. Um, so usually what I do is I scene frame. I like aggressively put them in a scene with two other players. And then yeah. suddenly there's three players in one scene. They all have to do something. And then I throw NPCs at all of them. So actually, that makes the turtling player interact with the other players instead of with me, the GM. So they're interacting with the other players at the table. Uh, so I find that actually to be pretty useful. And then once they kind of are like, oh, I feel comfortable talking now, then, you know, it's the talking thing. I'm comfortable talking at the table with everybody. Cool. Yeah, I think what Kira said is kind of the equivalent of what I said about combat in, yeah, in it is. a different kind of game in the sense that, like, Go like I remember the first time I asked my girlfriend, I was trying to like do like a more open, like you know, fate style skill system, and she was like, "Fuck it, I don't want to think about this," because she was brand new to the game, and it was like it was too open and it was too much of a spotlight. And I think creating something where the spotlight is mechanical, like everybody has to decide how they're hitting the goblin, or 
there's three goblins, you guys are in a closet, how are you going to do with it? Or there's people talking to you. In other words, creating it where it's like mechanically you have to do something rather than everybody look at Dave, Dave, you know, we'll all die if Dave doesn't do, do something. Is yeah, yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I can oh, bring it back. Like, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think you're right. Uh, you were just looking at it from the combat uh, area, arena, and I was looking at it from the narrative uh, intera social interaction arena, like different mechanics to mitigate both. Yeah, yeah but in both cases, you're but kind of putting them in a, in a place where they don't feel like they're getting special yeah. attention. They're just doing their job, and then and then in doing the job, they it's like a bartender has to give you a drink, but then they have to talk to you, and then it's like, okay, and then slowly you're talking. Um but I also think one thing, I don't because I don't know if we're going to get into this, and I feel like it's an important thing to point out. Every single answer to our questions that we're going to give today are probably something like, well, as the GM, you could do this, and that's going to take more energy and effort on your part. And I think there's a sort of meta advice to be able to enact all this other advice, which is if you're going to go into a situation where there's not a lot of new players or it's the first session... <laughs> As a GM, in order to have all this extra energy to devote to all these players and to devote to, you know, all these special things about first sessions, I think that should be the day that you're more prepared than any other day. You know, like, that should be the day where you're, you're, you're pretty sure about what you're going to run, you're pretty sure how all these things go, you're pretty sure how the moving parts will interact if people do different things, you're pretty sure that you've got a good place to sit down, you know where your dice are, you know where all your stuff is, I think that like that's actually the advice that will give you energy to follow all your other instincts, which are probably pretty good about how to deal with uh, players who are new. Um, but yeah. And I wanted to bring up another side point, just in case we don't get to it, um, and it's the difference between the online and in-person games. And I just wanted to kind of maybe list a couple things that would help an online game happen. And one is definitely make sure you get the technical bugs out of the way for an online game. So have people muster like half hour to 15 minutes ahead of the event time. And another is to um, maybe even have a practice session before the actual game session to make sure everybody's using the same software, they can connect, they're all doing the same thing, like not a lot of echo. If you notice, we all have headphones and mics, that kind of thing. Um, get the practical things out of the way because when you want to have that awesome first session, you want to game. You don't want to be troubleshooting, tech supporting, you know, all this other stuff. And that's different than in person. In person, I actually have nothing for my in person. You know, <laughs> get them together and play. But the online takes a lot more care. And another thing I want to add is overbook your event. Have a standby list if you're going to do an online game because online games are notorious for a high amount of cancellations. Mm -hmm. Life happens, and for some reason, people don't treat online as special as in person. So in person, if I say I'm going to go to your house, it's harder for me to call and cancel than if online you're in Germany and I say I was going to meet you. Yeah, it's easy for me to cancel. They're cooking enchiladas. I'm going to go eat enchiladas <laughs> instead of playing. So have a standby list so that you can actually call some people um, to fill in for the people that didn't show up. So just a few things I wanted to say about online to in-person kind of stuff to make your game actually go off. Trey, you, you pretty much summoned this question that I just put up here from uh, <laughs> Paul Vemeran who asked, do you run games online differently than you would a face-to-face -face tabletop session? Wow. Uh, tricks that you'd use more often in one or the other. Jeff, I want you to tackle this one from kind of a flail snails and your other experiences online. What what advice do you have about online uh, versus face-to-face? -face? Well, I struggled initially running online as opposed to face-to-face -face because I'm kind of the, the guy who likes to get up from the table, move about, and gesture in broad terms and things like that and so one of the things you really have to do is think about the tiny little frame we each exist in and so also grand gestures like picking up a die and rolling it and saying if I get a six you're dead you can't really do that effectively in uh, in an online environment so you have to rethink all sorts of strange affordances that w that are available to us online, but also things like having a chat window where you can have a side conversation at the same time you're talking can be extremely useful. 
So there are also good tools available to us when running online that would be harder to implement at the table. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure how much experience you have, uh, Todd and Kira, but Zach, did you have any online? Well, actually, no, Todd, you are running some stuff online recently. In fact, you're doing the Jank yeah, on yeah. Demand, so any yeah, thoughts that you have? Jank on Online Demand. Um, I, you know, it's, 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 it's newer to me. I Nothing has really struck me as super different aside from kind of like Jeff was just saying, I, I talk with my hands. And it's actually, that's been weird for me. So I, I, I find I'm going like this a lot when I, I GM online, <laughs> like trying to simulate talking with my hands in, in, in the little window. Um, yeah, I don't, so I don't think I have any, any really strong thoughts on that. It, feel, it feels somewhat similar to me. I do think it might be um, important to perhaps uh, move the spotlight a little bit more in... Um, Online gaming, I've found, because I think it's easier for people to lose focus, perhaps. When you're all sitting at the table, there's a sort of collective energy that happens when people are, you know, physically present with each other that is not the same as when people are little boxes in a window. Just give, I'll just give a really quick example. I've been playing a game online with some people, and um, the GM of that game a couple games ago would do these, like, hour-long scenes with characters individually, and then this last game switched it up where they were really moving the camera around every couple minutes going to a new person, giving someone else something to do. That was way more effective. I think that's way more effective anyways, but I think particularly in an online game, and particularly in a first session where you're trying to suck people in, uh, it's easier to disengage when you're in a room sitting by yourself at your computer than when you're actually present with people. An hour-long scene is a really long scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> online, yeah, online that's online game like time is a huge thing because it, people are usually visiting from overlapping time zones. Yeah. So like, and Jeff's game is uh, I know it's is two hours long exactly more or less, and so it's like there isn't a lot of that people showing up slowly, and then you get into the thing. It's like you kind of want to. I think the number one thing is to get into the game as soon as possible if you're running online and there's a hard time limit. Like, a few people, like, will just run until forever online because they've, they've managed to settle into a time slot with people they know where it goes, however long it goes. But for most of the part, you're going to be running a two-hour two game. So time management and making sure you get started on time is important. Um, I think uh, Todd's totally right about focus and getting everybody in as soon as possible. Uh, I, for games where there's mapping and physical stuff, I, it's good to use either uh, an, another site that does that. Twidla does that. It's also good to twidla.com. It's also you can use this little frame if the other people can see you to describe stuff. Like I'll be like, okay, up here where my fist is. <laughs> That's where the well is, and over here, coming into the size where the mushroom is, because you nice. can use that box. Um, so I think, I mean, there's a ton of little things. Like, I think the thing is just everybody's going to come with a different level of prep and a different amount of time, and a little, so you need to a little bit of customer care is is required around the edges. Uh, also, I think queuing up all the things that you're going to need. Um, in the game, if there are any online tools or there are any physical tools around you that you're going to have to go get, that's really important. Um, but you can also ask other people, like, has anybody got the DMG handy? You know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, okay, or here's a, this is one I actually end up using a lot online, is I'll be like, okay, Fred, you go look up your spell, and then we'll get back to you. And then Fred can go do that in a way that isn't as distracting as it would be in a real-life game. And then you can go and do, you know, anything that requires somebody looking up in a book, you can usually time manage around that in, a, in an online game um, if you're careful. And cool. I want to definitely put an exclamation on time management. If you set up an event, I do a lot of events on Google Hangouts. If you set up an event, respect the time that you start and respect the time you end. Because when people come to your event, they have looked at the time that you put there, and whether it be two hours or four hours, they usually 
you need a consensus to see if they can go longer or not. You can't just keep flowing it on like you can in person because it's like, well, I know they can't leave my house until whenever, but when they're online, they might just shut it off. Or like with me, I have a family. That might be half an hour before dinner time, so I got to go. You know, mm -hmm. if you said it was a two-hour event, I got to leave in two hours. So know how long your material is going to take. It was said before. Really, if you're doing your first game, know it really well. So again, with the time management, know how long your game's going to take and respect that time. Online. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to respect face-to-face. -face, don't respect time, right? Yeah, you can order <laughs> pizza and say, hey, we're going to hang out and do this a little bit longer. <laughs> Sweet. I am going to move to some questions here um, as we got about 20 minutes left here in the panel. Uh, Misha Krilov asked, uh, what's a trick that you use now that you wish you knew when you first started GMing? You know, I saw that question before, and, and I was I, that's one really caught my attention. And I think one thing I would think about as an answer to, to that is that I use I, I kind of came initially as a GM when I was younger with this understanding that like anything I put in the world I had to know exactly what the story was exactly what was going on and I actually think and I even think this is interesting in a first session you really don't need that right like most of the most interesting stuff that's ever happened at a gaming table where I'm GMing or where I'm playing is stuff that might have just gotten inserted into the game and you had no idea was going you didn't know what was going on um, I had a, a player once uh, do a, a, a thing in the game where they had a vision, and I randomly picked an NPC that they were friends with who was very mild-mannered and said, the vision is of this person killing a bunch of people. I described it. It was in the sewers, and, they, and you know this happened. Like, this isn't, this isn't a dream. This isn't something you made up. You know this happened. And they were in right away. I mean, the very next thing that happened is they, they kind of snapped out of it, and that NPC was standing right there, and they went, hey, how's it going? What's going on? And they were, they were never not interested in that NPC again. They were never not interested in, in this story again. So I even think in the first session, surprise yourself as a GM, right? Um, I'm thinking if people are watching the show Orphan Black, going back to this whole thing of, like, um, uh, the first session being, like, the pilot episode. The... And the, the, when the first episode of Orphan Black ended, I wanted the next episode immediately. It ends on this big cliffhanger, this big thing that happens, and I didn't know it was going to happen. It's, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Someone gets shot. It's crazy. And that kind of stuff, even as a GM, I think is really cool. Drop something in. Kill an NPC. Do something big. It doesn't matter if you don't know where it's going. Let your players react and then use their reactions to guide what actually happens. If they seem stoked on it, follow their reactions rather than worrying about figuring out beforehand, particularly in a first session. Drop something, especially at the end, right? The end of a first session, you have a week to think about it then or two weeks to think about it. So even if you don't know what's going to happen, it doesn't matter because you're, you're going to sound really cool when you drop that cool thing at the very end and then go, cool, session's over. You now have two weeks or a week or whatever it is to think about what that cool thing is going to be. So I think that's a big one for me. I used to think you always needed everything planned. You need to know the backstory of everything. You needed to know the logic of everything, and I no longer think that, uh, up to, particularly for cliffhangers like that. So, okay. My yeah. thing, I, I just got to do a quick shout-out to Savage Daddy, Jared Gunning. Uh, the thing that he taught me, and it was from playing in his games, was ask every player what do they expect to see tonight. I never did that until like recently. And he doesn't he makes sure to address it not in a way you ever expect, but he always makes sure to address it. If you wanted to have a love interest, you probably will have a love interest by the end of his session. Like just straight up asking the players, "So what do you want to see tonight?" You know, combat, whatever. So that's something that I've just learned to do and I'm still working with it. It's still very new to me, um, but I think it's something that's a lot of fun cuz when I hit it Everybody's happy. Zach, you're about to say something about Yeah, I was about to say an extension kind of of what Todd said, which was that I think like it's a slightly different idea, but kind of trawling your different players for what they're interested in rather yeah. than deciding that like I mean, I'm just I'm just running dungeons most of the time or half the time, especially with new players. And 
even then setting up a situation where like you have to solve the word puzzle or you're not getting out of this part of the dungeon means that especially if you have new players you don't know if you don't have a, a player who's into that then you lose them and so I think setting up the geography or the plot whatever you're basing your game around so that you're kind of waving a few different methods of problem solving or ways of playing the game in front of people and then you kind of play on what people pick up on uh, I think that that's a real that was something that really helped me. I, I do think it's important to challenge people with stuff that, that can only be solved by by applying their brain, but I think figuring out what motivates different players and, yeah. and setting up things to sort of test that is helpful in whatever kind of idiom you're using to test it. I also think that along with like not planning things, uh, now I don't know how this, useful this is in different kinds of games, but in Last Gasp has this great like make your own random generator page now online so you yeah. press one button and it's faster than the pre the ones that already exist uh, like Abby Lafio is pretty good um, but online totally random content for stuff that you think will come up a lot like uh, I just generated six treasures on the screen while I was talking to you guys um, that's <laughs> helpful to have because Very nice. uh, if you don't like what, even if, you know, you, you can find almost everything in a book somewhere online. You can cut it, paste it into one of those. And then any results you don't like, you can change. So you've got a sort of bank of things that you can rely on. And then before, nowadays, before I run one of my games, I queue up along the bottom of my browser all of the random generators that are germane to wherever I'm running that day. And if I get stuck, I can just hit something, and then something comes up, and I know it's not just the same themes and ideas that I would come up with on my own over and over again. Um, so yeah, those two things. Nice. <laughs> Jeff, got any yeah, advice you want to give to past self? Yes, uh, have a clear signal that the time for just normal social chit-chat and housekeeping <laughs> type stuff like buying equipment is over and the game is beginning now. Whatever that signal is, I've done it where I set my big purple 30-sided die in the middle of the table, and that means it's go time, or I just say transparently, hey, it's time to play now. What, whatever signal you agree upon, if you do it in the first session, the, by session five, it'll be automatic for the players to just fall in the line like that. That's a good idea. That's what I'm adding. <laughs> Kira, did you have any uh, advice to give older or younger Kira? I have five things, five quick things. I'm going to go through them real fast. I was writing them down. I was thinking. Um, cool. Uh, one thing I learned from Apocalypse World, which helps me still to, I guess even Dogs in the Vineyard did this, uh, was uh, PC, NPC, PC triangles. Uh, yeah. That it's so useful. You want to create triangles of people all the time. Uh, they don't have to be love triangles. They can be any kind of triangle. But you want to get two PCs involved with an NPC two PC, you know, three PCs involved, you know, some kind of triangles so you're connecting people, right? That's, like, essential to the narrative for me. I find that really definitely useful. Definitely in the first um, session, too. Definitely in the first session. It's hyper-useful. Yeah, you're creating yeah. instant drama when you do that. Um, asking leading questions is a really good one. So you can be like, um, well, uh, why did you kill your boyfriend uh, last summer at prom? And now you're, <coughs> you know... So stuff like that um, that gets people into the, the spirit of the game. Um, being transparent, you don't have to keep secrets from your players as the GM. I used to do that all the time when I was younger. I'd be like, I'm going to do the, the plot twist at the end, and it's going to be like a Shyamalan movie, and nobody's going to see it coming, and it was just so yeah. boring. Like, don't do that. Just be like, uh, I forget who was saying it, but like uh, at the beginning of the session, you can set a precedent and be like, all right, we're going to get to your love interest, and we're going to blow up some Nazis, and what does anybody else want to yeah. do? Um, aggressive scene framing is really good. Uh, so just, like, put people in a place and have an instant, uh, you know, opposition or an instant thing that they can attack right away. That's really awesome. And finally, I know this is a lot, I'm sorry, um, deferring authority. So as the GM, you're running the game, but really everybody is there to help tell the story together. So when you can, ask people questions and make them have them say the rules and uh, suggest different scenes ask them what, where you could be or what they'd like to be doing. I, I find all those things really useful because then I'm not, you know, as a GM I'm not really in charge 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just in the, that position there, so like anybody can kind of uh, be a part of that. So those are all really excellent, and I actually think they're all really useful for the first session too. Like the aggressive scene framing, I always think that. You know, some of the questions that we were getting for this were the kind of questions of, like, do all the characters know each other at the beginning? If they don't, how do you get them together? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have I have played the first session of, like, well, let's... Okay, you're all five different people who've never met and have nothing in common. Let's figure out how to get you all together. And there's a, I'm, I'm just kind of over that. Like, I, I don't really... I, and if, it's cool if people want to. Like, if you are really mm-hmm. a purist about that and you want to start with that, go nuts. But I tend to think that for a first session, too, aggressive scene framing is good, right? Like, yeah. um, or leading questions are good. You know, like, uh, the PC, NPC, PC triangles are good. If a PC starts looking at an NPC and going, you know, I kind of like that person. I'm, I'm going to hang out with that person. To me, there's something to the idea, then, of figuring out, well, one of the other PCs must have an opinion on them, too, right? Like, who else does this NPC know? Yeah. Because that way you can start by how everyone knows each other. You don't have to do the whole dance for two hours of let's figure out how everyone knows each other. Let's yeah. figure out how you all get in the same place. I you also can really like. Start it. I also really like how the game when the game just does that for me. The, the mechanics mm-hmm. like uh, in Fate, you know, we have these histories together in Apocalypse World. We have yeah. these relationships already, so super, you don't even have to worry about that in those games. I noticed in con games that if you just it, Everybody has a... If you get a relationship between the characters, but it's really short and it's simple, then people pick up on that for... Because they don't know each other in any other way. Yeah. And they run with it, and so you get something really cool by the end because everybody's got nothing else to play off of, like, when they start. And so, like, I remember in a con game, somebody's like, okay, you're the wizard, and that guy's your bodyguard. And we were, you know, for the rest of the game, that's like a, a fun double act. I'm like, go over there and open that door. And he's like, I'm not opening that door. I'm, what am I paying you for? And suddenly you've got a whole, and it was just one sentence. Yeah. You know, like you didn't have yeah. to sit and workshop out these relationships. Just having one, one functional relationship. Like saying, like, you guys are sisters is, doesn't say much about that. But I mean saying, like, oh, you saved so-and-so's life or something. Just like one thing can really jumpstart people taking off on their own. So I think something, one compressible relationship or two, yeah. mm-hmm. or especially among people who don't and know each that's a good one. Sorry, and I'd add, don't make it secret. Like you say, make it functional. Yeah. You know, bodyguard, mm-hmm. something that people can see, because secret stuff will get totally overlooked a lot of times. Yeah. It's yeah, and saying I... that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Was... We're excited now. Um, I was just going <laughs> to say, uh, Zach, what you said about um, making it obvious, like that's, I mean, just go for the obvious thing, that's the easiest thing, and build on that, uh, yeah. especially yeah. at a con game. Yeah, and if you can do something like an emotion that you feel, too, towards another character, like, we have a rivalry, right. or, you know, I killed your best friend, like something that's, like, passionate or uh, exciting is great, too. So. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, it's one funny of you were saying that, Zach. There's, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I'm gonna, this is this one's super short. So and and it doesn't. I just learned this about NPCs uh, long after I started, which was it doesn't matter what the NPC actually does, it's how much you invest in their voice and making them talk that <laughs> it gets the players invested. Like if it doesn't even have to be a good voice, it could be a very silly voice. But if you go, okay, the shopkeeper. Uh, the shopkeeper killed your mother, and he's in love <laughs> with your best friend, and he's Siamese twins. The players are like, yeah, yeah, okay, next so- shopkeeper. But if you go, the shopkeeper walks up to you and goes, hello, what would you like to yeah. buy? And this, you just, like, talk slowly, and you just, like, do that NPC. They could be the most boring NPC in the world, but that, those are the ones your players are going to like and remember. It's the performance, not actually necessarily... The content, all, that's the immediate hook, and that will get players to be like, oh, that guy died? That's terrible. I liked yeah. him. He had a funny voice. Amen. <laughs> I think this is true. That's really true. Session. Because for first sessions, like, I always think, like, going back to this idea of just dropping <laughs> stuff in, I always think that the important thing is you want to follow what your players are interested in. And your players are never, like you said, you're, I've never had players where I've introduced someone and given them an exposition dump about this person and then had them not, had, you know, their eyes glaze over when you start doing that. It's not the exposition dump that makes someone interesting. What it is, is the way they interact, like you said, the way they interact with the characters. So, like, pick a funny voice, pick a mannerism, 
and that's who pay, and then let, and then let their backstory emerge, right? Like then once you've introduced this person, if the players are gravitating to them, then you start to figure out all that other stuff. I was going to say before about the stuff you were, you were saying. It's funny we designed that. Uh, Megan from the, the cast and myself, the Jane cast and myself, are designing a game called Time Shell, so we're hoping to get it up this summer. And we designed <laughs> that literal thing into the game, where every time you introduce a PC, whoever the last PC introduced is, the two of them each draw a random card, and the card tells that one card will say something like sisters or siblings or uh, best friends, and the other card has a qualifier. That just says something like who hate each other or who can't keep their hands off each other or who literally fist fight all the time or who whatever it is, right? And as soon as you draw those things, to watch the players with, like I said, with just that little information suddenly spring to life with these characters is really cool. And I think that's the, the best way to do it for a first session is to find those little springboard things. Like I said, either someone's voice or some little tiny descriptor that lets people find the little things to grab onto in the world and enact at the table and embody at the table and kind of springboard off of creatively. And just to emphasize, I am bad with accents, so mannerisms work just as well. All my accents are the yeah. same, and they're horrible, whatever they end up being. Um, but having, like, the one that farts all the time while you're talking to them or something that stands out, a mannerism that stands out will really make that NPC pop. That's Don't true. worry about the exposition. Screw the exposition. Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, jump in here, man. You've been quiet. I know you've got something Sorry. to say. Are you gonna you're gonna tell us that we need parties, right? You gotta build the party in the first session. That's why you're quiet because you love that. Is that is that the truth? I build the party in the first session by putting the pressure on them and attempting to kill them with all sorts of horrible monsters. So if you do that, <laughs> they become pals very quickly. Um, but uh, one thing I would like to add here as a good technique for a first session that's not directly related to what we've been talking about is have as very few as possible seemingly meaningless roles. Like, uh, the, the kind that I hate the most is the, the perception check that you have the player roll and then if they fail the roll you tell them nothing. And it's a, it seems empty from the player point of view. So yeah. what you do is you reframe it as something like, okay, you're going to roll a perception check now because you just stepped on a trap and we're going to see if you perceived it in time or not before it goes off. Or you're going, to, you're looking for secret doors, okay, if you make the roll, you find the secret door before the monsters on the other side open it and come pouring into the room. So try to eliminate as many as possible of those rolls that have null results of some sort and it will add a lot of pep to that first session. And is a general good practice, I think. Nice. I was just going to say that's a really that's the opposite of good advice in Call of Cthulhu because in Call of Cthulhu, <laughs> you just tell people to roll all the time, and they 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 play the game in their heads themselves. But but yeah. <laughs> we are coming up near the end of the hour. I'm sorry, Trey. Did you have a quick thing, Dad? Yeah, I want to add something that's not relevant to the question, but it needs to be said from my perspective. Try to avoid character generation during the first session. Like, if you can do it as a, pr a pre-log or prolog, whatever, before the game, do that. Don't make your first awesome session be just creating characters. Hmm. All right, interesting. All right, uh, we got. We're going to end up with a question here. Uh, it was mirrored. Aaron Field as well as Jesse Combs asked, uh, "What are some games or, that are great for an awesome first session? And what are some bad ones?" Every game is great for an awesome first session. <laughs> that's a trick question. <laughs> I, think uh. a, I think the idea that there might be a game that's bad for the first session is kind of interesting. And I'm leaning toward game, like trying to think. Of, I think maybe Pendragon might be <laughs> right. Oh, why? Why? Because I mean, I like Pendragon a lot, but I feel like it's probably one of the few games that depends so much. It would suck as a one shot. Oh, I right? see. You know what I mean? It depends so much on your characters kind of growing in their relationship to each other and their personality and their weird night issues. Uh, over the course of the game, that I'm not going to say it makes a that it makes a bad first session, but it almost seems like the game where a one shot is the hardest to properly design for that game, or a first session is the one where you have to be like, all right, kids, this is just a beginning, and it gets better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
That's like yeah. that's like you gotta wait through the whole first season of the TV show to get to the good stuff. Like in those very long term campaign type games. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of those. I have trouble with first sessions with games like, say, the Hero System, where you're playing a superhero game and everybody's got 14 different weird powers they built themselves. It's it's uh-huh. hard to craft a good sort of opening adventure that's going to highlight everybody's individual sort of super abilities. With D&D, you yeah. know, okay, i got to put some traps for the thief to find, a skeleton for the cleric to turn. It's a fairly small set list of things that you should ideally include in that first adventure. When somebody can fly and somebody can walk through walls and somebody can read minds, you're not going to get to everybody in that first session. You know, I, I think the, the way I would answer this that. is... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, for that one, uh, superhero game, first session is they fight each other uh, in the danger room, and then you adjust all their powers for how well they did and handicap them, and then, anyway. Nice. I was going to say, to me, a good a game that's good for a first session is a game... I mean, any game can be good for a first session if the first session is good, but... A, a game that thinks about the first session, I think, is really cool. And obviously, Apocalypse World is an example of this. There's a whole chapter in the book called The First Session that tells you what to do during the first session and how to GM differently during the first session and what to, kind of stuff to look for in the first session and then gives you a worksheet to fill out if you're the MC when the, the session is done. Like, that is a game that thought about the first session. So to me, I mean, that might be an interesting kind of design thing for... Um, and I see this more and more. I mentioned Swords Without Master before. Swords Without Master does have a um, first session that starts with a sort of tutorial to get you into the world, get you into the characters, get you into the game. And I do think there might be something going forward that that's something designers might want to think about is, is this a game where you should think differently during the first session, where there are things you should do during the first session, where as a designer you should include some kind of thing saying, here might be things you can do in the first session, here's how you should run it, here's how you introduce people to the rules. In the same way that lots of video games have sort of like the opening mission where they kind of tutorial you on some of the world, on some of the stuff you can do. Um, I'm not saying every game needs that, but I could imagine certain kinds of games dealing really well with that and that being useful. So I would say you could have a first, a good first session in a game, but the more the game itself and the designer themselves thought about that sort of thing I think is, is probably going to be helpful and is probably going to make that game pop as having a first session. So everybody My should answer... go back and rewrite their games for, for you, Todd? Is that... <laughs> yes, please do. 100%. Uh, okay. That's, I do that's that's it really that. useful. Okay, so <laughs> joking, I'm joking. So, um, Jeff, what, what about you? Any games you think uh, are, are good or bad for first sessions? Well, I don't know. Uh, I run mostly, almost exclusively D&D nowadays, and I find the earlier editions make for quick character generation, so you can do it at the session if you have to. Um, I think I think games where there are a lot of mechanics involved in whatever it is the game is about are harder in the first session, but you have to be prepared to take it slow and to walk the new people through it, and so even that you can totally do. Um, also, I think you have to whatever you pick, you have to give yourself uh, room to have a bad first session possibly and just try again in the second session. So this whole thing is about having an awesome first session. It's okay to have a bad first session and get back on the horse and try again in two weeks. So, you know, you don't have to put all your, you know, psychological needs into that first session and being a success. I see Kira is making a list, so maybe we should go to her before it becomes too long. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, I'm just doodling. I just, I'm sorry. I'm an artist. I just, <laughs> but uh, but um, this is a hard question for me. I think different games run for sessions differently. Uh, I don't know if they run them better or worse. Uh, one shots, I think, are different. Like some games are meant just to be a one shot, like Kagamatsu or Quiet World a uh, year. Um, I think that, uh, what was I just thinking of? Um, shoot, I can't, oh, I was just thinking how fun it was, actually, to, I mean, Apocalypse World games, you're right, do uh, first sessions really well, so, like, I, I'm i playing a lot of Apocalypse World iterations, like Night Witches and Dream of Skew, or two games I'm pretty much my favorite right now, um, but I don't know if anyone's played Tenro Bancho Zero, 
But uh, the, the first session in that game is really fun because you all, as PCs, roll on this relationship chart for each other. And you find out how you feel about each other, and that's absolutely ridiculous and super fun. Um, so maybe that's that's a good first session game because you get like all that relationship energy going, and I don't know. That that was fun. I think uh, first sessions also kind of depend on how likely there is to be a second session with that same exact group. True. Sure. You know, like sometimes my second session is going to be I'm going to have a second session, but it might be two of the same people and three different people. And sometimes I know that this is a concrete group and they're always going to be together. Um, and sometimes it's a one-shot that could be extensible. I think those are all things where you'd think about. I think for your first game period, like if nobody, if you have people who've literally never played before, I think a game which requires a lot of, that doesn't have a lot of cliches can be bad. Because you're like, all right, have you heard of steampunk? Um, sort of. Okay, it's like steampunk, but instead of Ross, it's lobsters, and it's in Indonesia, and everything's upside down. And I feel like that's great and wonderful if your players have been playing other games and they've, you know, kind of got into the, they're down the rabbit hole with you. Um, but I think for people who are brand new, cliches rock on toast. Um, and I was so <laughs> glad that I could say to my players, like, did you see Lord of the Rings? Yes. Okay, <laughs> the people in the elf dwarf go. You know, like, that. Uh, so it depends on, you know, who your, who your group is and, and how, um, how, how, how stable the group is, you know, uh, in terms of your personnel going in and out. Very cool. Very cool. Any, uh, any last thoughts on uh, great first session games or not so great first session games? Highlight the players. That's like my number one yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, get them into it. Get them role playing. Don't don't describe the the setting for an hour and a half. That's boring. Just uh, get the players playing. Watch yeah, your I favorite pilot that. episodes of your favorite TV shows and figure out what they do. Like, and of different genres too, right? Like, it, like do look diagram them literally. Like, what do they do? And then. If you need to copy that, like, was it when? When? What did they introduce? How did they introduce the characters? How did they introduce information? Um, that would be a great way to do it. Or, or even I, I tend to be like Kira and think of, of gaming more like TV shows. But even if you, if you think of it more like reading a book, read the first chapters of your favorite books and think about how they introduce characters, introduce the world, introduce information, introduce conflict, whatever it is, and think about how that would be accomplished at a game table. That would be my final thought. And I look at it way meta, like pick a game you enjoy as a GM, and that's really going to come through. So try and pick something you really like that you want to expand on and do all these tricks that we've talked about already, but if you're not loving it, they're probably not going to love it, and you're the grand <laughs> maestro. You're the one that's really facilitating everything. Um, you're the ringmaster, and so you keep the... F not the fun happening, but you keep the momentum of the game going. And so, yeah, pick something you enjoy. Um, and I also think Fate is a great game for a first session because it makes the players really talk to each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Jeff, any final thoughts from you, sir? Yeah, um, whatever work you put into the game ahead of time, and you should put in lots of work for your first session, and whatever you think about your wonderful campaign and whatever you think about your wonderful adventure, it's really about placing the players in a situation where they can make some meaningful choices. Yep. Everything else is secondary. Cool, cool. Um, Zach, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think that's that's... Definitely true. I think the, the point of all that prep is to be able to return an interesting out uh, input when the players do their thing. Yeah. Like, you prep, you don't prep the beginning so much and then the players can screw around on the edges. You prep a sort of circle of responses and the players can go in any direction. And so you've got all this stuff ready to go. They go, oh, you want to go in that closet? I know what's in that closet. <laughs> oh, you're looking on that shelf? I have a whole table of what could be on that shelf. So the players, you want to do all your magic tricks that day. You know, like make the players really feel like no matter what choices they make, you'll return something interesting. And then you can half-ass it for the rest of the, for the, rest <laughs> of the time you play because you press the hell out of the first day. I mean, um, 
like anybody in special effects, if you watch their movies, they'll be like, yeah, you just you do all the crazy effects on the first day. Like you built, we built all that crazy furniture for the first three minutes of Lord of the Rings so that the hobbits would really look small. And then after that, you just shoot them yeah. in front of a tree, and people go, oh, they're they're small, without even thinking about it. So you sell them yeah. on that first day. You sell them on the idea that there's something behind every door, around every corner. You you prep the hell out of that, and then after that, they won't know when you're just like, oh, jeez, and you just make something up. Um, cool. I just want to highlight something real quick before we end uh, that Trey said. Um, that's all awesome. I agree. <coughs> Having those lists of things, Zach, uh, is really super helpful and awesome. That's a good way to, to use that prep. But also, Trey, you said uh, be excited as the GM to run the game, and that's also super important. Um, and also as a GM, you're the player. So you should have fun, too. You're also playing the game. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, do something that's fun for you and make sure that you're having fun and you're not just, uh, you know, doing a lot of work, right? So have fun. That's, that's the goal. That's a great way to end it. Uh, thank you, Zach, Trey, Todd, Kira, and Jeff. Thanks, all of you. Uh, your advice has been great. I've learned a few things here myself. Uh, and, uh, and thank you. This was Indie Plus talking about how to uh, GM an awesome first session. I hope you have an excellent evening. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Good thank night, you. Everybody.